Mm. You know, nothing gives a cup of tea quite the kick like the shattered dreams of your enemies. You know, I do love a good video essay. They're great background noise and the really good ones do tend to get you to think, oh, you know, I never thought of it that way. That's quite interesting. And I want to get in on this. Oh, maybe I could do a video about the themes of sacrifice and redemption that permeate Dragon Ball Z. But of course, that would be ridiculous because you're smart, you already know this. So what can I take a crack at? Perfect! Nobody's ever done analysis for anything from Disney before. Disney's fame was established through its animated movies, usually based on popular fairy tales, adopting the basic storytelling tropes and attitudes, and maintaining this blueprint throughout the 20th century. Because of this, one of the main criticisms has been how they've written their female characters. Since these films have been based on fairy tales, it was sort of inevitable they'd be antiquated attitudes towards women. A virginal, powerless girl with no autonomy over her own story versus a powerful, authoritative woman who takes actions to accomplish her goals. Guess which one you're meant to root for. The rule is, be perfect or be punished. There is no in-between. This may have created a very lucrative princess brand, but it also developed an identity that Disney has spent years trying to shake off. Leading to a few years in the early 2000s of them having something of an identity crisis. But it came out the other side with another potential renaissance. This was spearheaded by the success of a low-key, understated little film, you might have heard of it, called Frozen. One of the most, if not the most lucrative film they've ever made. Not considering inflation. Introducing a collection of new, iconic characters, Olaf, Elsa, Anna, Kristoff, and Hans. The villain of the movie! Spoilers! Yes. Mad, bad, and dangerous to know. He was meant to be a subversion of the Prince Charming archetype. And since there's not a huge amount of video analysis on this character... Oh. Well, I'm a little fish. They won't mind. They won't mind. But before we get any further, let me just address what a lot of you might be thinking. It's a kid's movie. Yes, I know. Do you think I'm not painfully aware of this fact? You might say that's a reason to just let it go. Kids' films do not need this sort of deep-dive examination. Well, I'm going to flip that argument right around and say that is a reason why we should be critical of kids' media. Because do you know what happens when we become comfortable just putting any old dreck in front of our kids? Sequels! Horrible, horrible sequels! One after the other after the other! You may not remember the dark times, but I do. I was there. And I will do what I can to make sure they never return. So let's talk about Hans. First things first though, between Frozen 2 and Rise of Skywalker, I've noticed Disney's apparent distaste for evil redheads. No, I'm not saying that I feel attacked. Except I'm feeling attacked. Hans is one of Disney's twist villains first seeming like the beguiling prince ideal, romancing the sheltered princess Anna, later revealing he's just making a punt for the crown. From what I can see in the fandom, he's got an intense Marmite effect. People either love him or they hate him. And oddly, each one seems to feel that they're the minority. One side arguing it's wrong to defend an irredeemable monster, the other side describing him as a much more complex character. I've even seen the phrase Byronic to describe him. They seem to see something much deeper here. And we will talk about all of that in a moment. But first, I want to tackle his main purpose as a character. Se 
hairdressing. Disney's greatest talent is being able to churn out aesthetically on point, perfectly marketable characters. And it's clear Hans was purposefully designed to be... You're gorgeous. Wait, what? Just look at the way he's introduced to the audience. He smacks Anna in the face with his horse. Subtle. Practically every aspect of Hans was designed in a calculated way to be just the kind of man that would tempt an isolated princess who's never had many experiences with men. If he had looked like this guy, might not have had the same effect. The perfect bait. The siren's song to her horny sailor. A Saracenia to her blue bottle. And I'm realising that this is all making him sound like a femme fatale from a really cheesy film noir. The snowman always rings twice. There is a boy version, it's called Homme Fatale, but I like alliteration. He's manipulative and dangerous, and he uses his wiles primarily to seduce someone. Or at least as... at least the Disney version of it. And just like his old school comparisons, gets his comeuppance for his wicked ways. How dare you be good looking and evil! Get punched! So that's it. He's too sexy to live. But if that was the case, why do so many people have such an interest in his character as well? I, earlier, I wasn't using Byronic as a joke. Like, that is something that I've seen people describe him as, so... They must see something more here. So, I took a long, thorough look at the online discourse. The only discourse that really matters. And I do mean long. Yeah, anyone who knows me knows how long I've been meaning to do this video. <laughs> and I kept seeing a book mentioned, a time publication that's a rereading of Frozen, but set from Hans's perspective, called A Frozen Heart. Calling me curious. And because of that, I had to buy a book. A book! With paper in it. Like I'm some sort of Anne Prime. Shall I go into the forest and make myself a mud hut and eat psychotropic mushrooms? That actually might be an idea. You might be wondering, why didn't you just get the audiobook? And that is a valid critique. But if it's not read by Jack Davenport, I do not see the point. Sorry, Andrew Eden. I just had to pretend I was reading this on AO3. Well, I guess it's a type of fan fiction. So, welcome to a new segment called Hanorama's Book Club. Hopefully a short-lived segment. But before we actually dive into the book itself, there's just a couple of points I want to talk about. They don't really matter, they don't really have any purpose, but I like them, so I'm going to talk about them. One, this book introduces us to some more characters. For example, Hans's older brothers. One of those brothers is Lars. Lars is a precious boy and must be protected at all cost. He's not the king of the Isles, but he's the king of my heart. And if anything happens to this boy, anything at all. Number two, the bit where Hans meets Oaken. The man is definitely flirting. Go on, Hans. Try on his legless trousers. Look, people can argue that the family in the sauna were just customers, but I will be damned if anyone is going to try and convince me that he was not flirting with Hans. They meet, and his first instinct is to get this man into a speedo. I see you, Elizabeth Rudnick. I see you. Right, now, onto the book. I was disappointed when I found out actually the chapters swap between Hans and Anna. I'll admit, I'm biased. I preferred his chapters over hers. Skip our head, skip our head. I just found them more engaging and they gave me a new perspective on a story I've already heard. What I do like about her chapters is that it shows in more detail how her anxiety can spiral. Same but also her over-exaggerated expectations of a love, romance, and men. And it kind of makes it seem real easy how she replaced one with the other. Real Henry VIII energy here. Christoph, be careful. Right, now on to Hans's chapters. 
His chapters get into his intelligence, his bottomless pragmatism, and eventual embracing of his family's ways of violence and dominance. Because you know what else I found in this book? A whole lot of toxic masculinity. The term itself has lost a lot of its initial impact from people misinterpreting the idea from its name alone. Not on purpose. And also very much on purpose. But for this example, the best way to describe it is it's not masculinity or men that's toxic, it's the poisonous stereotypes of what it means to be a man forced upon them. Telling men to never express themselves beyond aggression or as a way to be the most in control in any given situation. Or if they can't or won't maintain this intensive image, they'll get told to man up, among other things. Society tells men as a group to always be strong, to never show their feelings to anyone. And then we wonder why there is such a problem in men's mental health in our culture. Okay, seriously, who does this toxic masculinity think that she is? Coming after my boys? And that is what Elizabeth Rudwick describes in her book so well. Hans is trapped in a situation he didn't agree to and told he must endure, and all of the unhealthy ways he attempts to cope with that. The worst part is, through all of this abuse, emotional and physical from his brothers. Except for Lars. Lars is a good boy. People know. His father knows what's being done and encourages it. All his sons must be strong, and if there's weakness, it is to be beaten out. And despite this, Hans loves his abusers. He's desperate for their acceptance and their respect, particularly from dear old dad, the one who should have been protecting him from this. Look, I know Disney's going through this thing where they're trying to make their villains more relatable, but good God, Disney! Too real. Too real. So Hans tries to shape himself into the image of his father, the strongest man he knows. So, it sort of feels like a gendered sort of version of Mean Girls, but darker. So, Heathers? Okay, all right. If in Frozen 3, there is a Disney Prince version of a song akin to Candy Store? Greatest moment in animation history! <laughs> and like any good novelization, it adds more meat to the bones of the film. If you're a Frozen fan, you probably know that in the beginning of the production, Elsa was intended to be the villain, until that reality-shattering song was penned, and the movie was in need of a new antagonist. And all eyes turned to Hans. That is why we got this scene. If only there was someone out there who loved you. You can almost hear the storyline tearing desperately trying to make this work. In the book, it does work. Because rather than bending the logic of the plot to make this twist happen, this is Hans taking his anger and frustration over years of damage done out on someone he sees as weaker than him. It's that cycle again. The one I mentioned in my Frankenstein video. One hurt leads to another hurt. As Hans uses Anna as an outlet. This isn't an excuse for his actions in the film. It's worse. It's a reason. An excuse alleviates any guilt a person might have for their actions. A reason can legitimise them. It's a very human motivation, one that we're not used to Disney villains having. Which might be why people hate him. He's not an enjoyably over-the-top, moustache-twiddling bad guy. 
he's much more human, much more understandable. And people don't like that. After reading this book, this scene hits a lot differently. If only there was someone out there who loved you. So the book strengthens the weaker elements of the film's story. Oh, but wasn't that nice of Elizabeth Rudnick? She fixed it for you. And it also recontextualised the end. Anna decides to send Hans back home because there is no greater punishment she can think of than to send him back to that tragedy of a family that is never going to be fixed. Dark. See, see, this is typical of Disney. I get latched onto a character, usually a secondary character, and then they get fleshed out to the point where, to me, they seem even more interesting than the main characters, and then they just get fobbed off in the movies. They keep doing that! Again, I don't want to say that I am feeling attacked, but I'm feeling attacked. So, how did I find the book? I found it very enjoyable, and hugely frustrating. It added layers and intricacies that elevated the story. Shame it's not in the movie. And because the movie is what everyone has seen, even though Hans's tale is clearly from a different world than Frozen's framework, it still has to be held to the same moral standards of the narrative. It all ends up making him a much weaker character. And it causes the story to suffer as well. With the only other main male character being Kristoff, this creates an uncomfortable dichotomy between Dream Boy Mountain Man or an Incubus. You know, be perfect or be punished. So, what to do with Hans now? Since the release of Frozen, there's been vague references and cameos in other media, with the most prominent probably being Once Upon a Time. In a show that prides itself on expanding villain storylines and creating endearing anti-heroes, when it came to Hans, they didn't. The most recent appearance was the Rat King of video game series, Kingdom Hearts, in which he has no lines, and we just get told he has a lot of darkness in him. Yeah, he does! Now, if I've lured you here to this video because you're a fan of this character, you might be wondering, am I going to talk about the hashtag? Let's talk about the hashtag. Because of course there's a hashtag. Redemption arcs are not an easy thing. Taking a character and flipping the script on them after already solidly establishing them in your audience's eyes and giving them a completely different viewpoint. It's not an easy task. But it's not impossible. A writer just has to be smart about it and give it the time and dedication to doing it well. Now, am I calling filmmaker Jennifer Lee a coward? Well, I guess I technically just did, but I don't mean it. Mostly. She's talented, intelligent, grade-A spectacle wearer. Which just makes me wonder why she never circled back to this guy. To be fair, she could have just have gotten tired of being added with the hashtag for six years. Oof. Or she just plain doesn't like the character. But if that's the case, surely that's even more reason to bring him back. You see, the thing about redemption arcs is that the character has to earn it. Which means now we get to teach him a lesson. Let's look at a series that is lousy with redemption arcs. Dragon Ball Z. Oh yes, I brought it all back to Dragon Ball Z. That is called Setup and Payoff. And we all know which character I'm going to be focusing on. Yamcha, yeah, just kidding. It's Vegeta. Vegeta's long road to redemption was typified by one thing. Suffering. 
starting with an uneasy alliance on Namak, leading to a heart-wrenching death that takes the character and rips them open. And then he's killed. But is that not enough for you? Okay, we're bringing him back. We're bringing him back. He's not done suffering yet. And then he becomes a father. The greatest punishment of all. Bulma channeled her inner Captain Kirk, saw the half-naked alien in front of her and figured she has to do her duty for the Federation. And the biggest turning point is when he saw his son Trunks killed in front of him. His son is also from the future. Look, I'm trying to get through a lot of lore in a very short amount of time. Just bear with me, okay? This is where we get to see how his motivations have changed. And he has more things that he wants to fight for. Redemption arcs can be some of the best stories written if it's done with authenticity and a willingness to give it the time and consideration it deserves. Big risk, big reward. But if anyone could, why not Jennifer Lee? After all, there is so much melodrama to be milked from a family that really needs to talk, but it would mostly just be yelling. You know, just, I hate you. Well, I hate you. You ain't my mother. Yes, I am. Ah! And surely a story about breaking a cycle of toxicity, growing and moving on, is a better moral for little boys than the one that they are bound to a narrative that says they have no choice but to be the villain. Like it says in the book, Violence begat violence. It was inevitable. Yet that was all his family knew. That's bleak. I know expecting such a heavy storyline is a big ask, especially from Disney. But isn't that something the company's been leaning more and more into with its animated productions? Disney, for years, have been trying to write more mature stories with strong ladies, less mustachioed twiddling villains, and attempting to deal with heavier subjects. Only problem there is that, even though that is a good thing to attempt, it's always going to be hindered by the corporation having to do a Disney by shaving off anything with too much edginess. When Frozen was still in development, one of the songs that was penned and later not used was Life's Too Short, a song that showed that there was still a rift between the sisters, conflict and awkwardness that isn't going to be instantly solved with a hug and a sing-song. It was something that would have rounded out our leading ladies, making them not quite as blameless, and give them faults that didn't somehow paradoxically make them more virtuous. And I'm not even getting started on the sequel. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. I'm going to bed. I'm not dealing with this right now. Or maybe ever. So, Frozen, on a surface level, can seem more sophisticated. But ended up with something even simpler because of the insistence to smooth out those edges. Why do you do that, Disney? A lot of people... like the edge. If you've made it this far into the video, Thank you, this is a very long time to talk about a cartoon character, so thanks. I don't think I'm going to blow anyone's mind with this video. I just want to put out the idea of looking past the initial reaction you have to a character and thinking about what purpose they serve. Art critic John Berger said, You painted a naked woman because you enjoyed looking at her, put a mirror in her hand and called the painting Vanity thus morally condemning the woman whose nakedness you had depicted for your own pleasure. Jennifer. The character doesn't really choose any of their actions. That's chosen by the writer, director, the company. They choose their actions and what they deserve because of it. To paraphrase the great philosopher Jessica Rabbit, he's not bad. He's just digitally rendered that way. So, am I saying, hashtag redeem harms? Well, it's something I'd like to see, because I think there is a lot of untapped potential in this character. Disney! Tap that! But I will say one thing though. Redeemed evil princes 
do tend to make bank and Disney likes to make bank. He may hate the character's guts, but Akira Toriyama appreciates that Vegeta merchandise probably paid for his kid's education. So he holds his nose and makes that sweet, sweet anti-hero yen. And that is why we stan Akira Toriyama in this house. That's what the whole video has been about. Good night, everybody.